brothers and sisters, welcome to the study of the book of Acts. So last uh, Sunday, we started this uh, study and we looked at the introduction. And uh, I believe you were blessed as I was blessed with that introduction. We look at the book of Acts and started by looking at the mission of Jesus Christ, because it was this mission that Jesus committed to his disciples to carry out. And that is what brought about Acts. And we discussed two main discussion points. So let me just key into that. The first discussion point was what is or constitute the will of God that Jesus came to do. We shared um, four key points which are all together, and I have highlighted the last point because you can actually summarize everything into those uh, last points. And even with that last point, you can still bring out just one word that will indeed cover everything. So uh, we made a point that Jesus Christ stated that he came to do the will of God. And so the question is, what is this will or what constitutes the will of God that Jesus Christ came to do on earth? And four key points. Number one was to fulfill uh, the law, the old covenant, and establish the new covenant in his blood. And you see why this is really critical point to make as we go on. Number two, to destroy the power of Satan and establish the kingdom of God. Because the... Our first, uh, the first man, Adam, our first father, Adam, um, had consented to the devil, as we studied previously, committed the sin of treason, and by subtlety, the devil uh, came into the world and usurped power. So Jesus came to restore, destroy that control of the devil, and Establish the kingdom of God. Number three, to redeem and reconcile humankind to God through his blood, that is by forgiveness of sins and then establishing the making of the new covenant and bringing all this together is to reveal God to humankind and grant humankind God's Holy Spirit, salvation and eternal life. That is to make us sons and daughters of God because that's what God has always uh, wanted, and that's what God created man for, to have fellowship continually. Well, that fellowship was broken, so God sent his son Jesus Christ to do this. So the will of God that Jesus was talking about, we treated that. And then we look at discussion number two and said, now we know the will of God which you can simply summarize in that last line to bring salvation to humankind, restore us to the position of sons and daughters of God. But how would this will of God be implemented? That is, what was Jesus or what is Jesus' strategy for the implementation of this will of God? We looked at a number of scriptures and they came up with these num uh, points. Uh, as we could see in Acts chapter 1, um, starting from verse 4 to 8, I think we will just re read that because it's going to dovetail into a lot of things we're going to do today. So let's just read it again, Acts chapter 1, uh, from verse 4 to 8. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And they were thinking about the physical kingdom, but they asked, nevertheless, and Jesus answered them, that this restoration is a different one. In verse 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8, the key verse. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and Samaria and to the, uh, to the end of the earth. This was what Jesus answered. So um, we read a number of scriptures that we can right away say that the implementation strategy of Jesus Christ is number one, by the Holy Spirit and power. As he said, tarry ye. Uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. But in the book of Luke chapter 24, uh, uh, 44 through 49, or there about 49, 48 and 49 in particular, he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem till the promise comes. So it's first the Holy Spirit. That's been strategy number one, that we, those who will carry out this work must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So it's by the Holy Spirit and power. Number two, by the way people, the way people. We also discuss the way people that Jesus Christ didn't form uh, denominations. He didn't form synagogues. He didn't form cathedrals. Jesus Christ brought a movement, a change, a new way. He declared in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So he brought the way of life, the new way of life, by the new covenant in his blood. And everyone who comes into this way is transformed by the Holy Spirit and empowered to do this will of God, the will of God that we enumerated earlier. By this power of the Holy Spirit then, and the wisdom, the strategy, there are different ways that people who have come into Christ have fulfilled this movement, but it's all a movement. You see, that's why you cannot trap Jesus into a building. You can trap God into a building because he came to change the whole world. It is a movement, brothers and sisters. You must understand this. And that's why we must clearly understand the mission of Christ as the book of Acts lays it out. So he raised up the way people as uh, Acts of the Apostle kept calling them until Acts chapter 11, when the way people were called Christians, and today we are known by that name Christians. And I love that name Christians, like Christ. And thank God for his guidance. You know, the book, the Spirit of God has led um, uh, me to put together, which is the basis of our teaching who is a Christian, to help us understand what it really means to be a Christian. A Christian is not about religion. No, it is about life. It is about coming into the way, becoming the way people, the way of life, the way of God. There is only one way. There is no other way. So Jesus emphasized it. I am the way, the truth. And the lie. No man comes to the Father except by me. You have to come to this point of realization, brothers and sisters, that this is about life. This, can, this life cannot be trapped by anything. It cannot. It cannot. You know, that's why sometimes uh, in the and what is called dark age, people burn people, they burn churches, they burn. Uh, 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 Bibles, you know, they, they even seize Bibles because they think that this way is a physical thing. It can be trapped. You cannot trap it anywhere. It is a spiritual movement. It is led by the Holy Spirit of God. And everyone who comes into this way has to start by the Spirit of God. So I take time to emphasize that point because that's the key. So the implementation strategy of Jesus Christ, number one, to give the Holy Spirit of the Father to those who believe in him. And these are the way people, that is those who receive Christ. And these way people who have received the Holy Spirit are therefore transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit 
to live like Christ and therefore be Christ's witnesses. This way people, those who have been transformed, those who have received the power of the Holy Spirit will then preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. What do they preach? Repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And as they preach, they also manifest the power of God in miracles, signs, and wonders in the name of Jesus Christ as evidence, as evidence and love of God to bring many into the way, into Christ, into this life, this eternal life. So brothers and sisters, as we concluded, that the acts of God and Christ Jesus through believers, the way people or Christians continue till today, it must continue in you, it must continue in me. Amen. So this two point is what I'm emphasizing. There are those who will preach repentance and forgiveness of sins, in the name of Jesus Christ and ignore the power thereof. It is incomplete. And there are those who are preaching the power, miracles, signs, and wonders, and they ignore the repentance and forgiveness of sins. This go together to bring many into the way. This is what Jesus has commissioned us to do. As the apostles of old did, so it continues till today. And this is what the book of Acts is about. So that's a summary of what we covered uh, last uh, Sunday, just a recap. Today we want to look at the uh, lessons and key scriptures. Of course, that will also uh, mean we discuss uh, notable characters just to run through the book of Acts speaks a lot about God and very few verses calls use the word father in fact you see father in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 uh, beyond that you see the word God Jesus Christ, you see a God being used, you see Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit used a lot. In Acts chapter one, just touching on that, uh, remember when Jesus Christ was speaking in verse seven that I just read earlier, you will see they say, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. And if you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 33, you'll also see the word Father being used. In fact, let's read that because the three come together. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Look at it with me. Let's start from verse 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. This was Paul's, and this was Peter rather speaking after the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke by the power of the Holy Spirit to the people. This was Peter's witness explaining what has happened. Amen. Okay, so when we so in terms of div divine, the divine in Acts, God, the Father, is used, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now we talk about disciples and believers. So these are the notable characters we can refer to: Peter, Paul, Philip, Stephen, James, John, Barnabas, and other disciples and believers. We talk about the religious uh, group. High priest, you see, Pharisees and others, which you know, political group. You think about King Herod, King Agrippa, governor, uh, the governors, Felix and Festus, rulers and elders of the Jews, economic leaders, 
uh, the Jews and Gentiles. This is very important to note, the Jews and Gentiles, because at the time that we are talking about, Jerusalem and Jews were under Roman Empire. So the political power of the day was the Roman Empire. And so you would see um, how then Peter leading the implementation of the will of God to the Jews in Jerusalem and in the um, neighboring areas of Jerusalem and how God raised up Paul who led the implementation to the others who are called the Gentiles. Like I mentioned earlier, that it's important to take note of that um, word. Um, Jesus came to fulfill the old law and establish the new covenant. It is in the context because the Jews already had the old covenant, right? And the rest of the world lived, like Paul explained, with just uh, their own ways and conscience. But of course, when you come into the covenant, you would see that that same practice that the Jews practiced, that is the blood of bulls and goats, were being practiced almost everywhere else. However, like Paul made us to understand, he said that what the Gentiles sacrifice, the sacrifice to demons, the devil had, who is always a copier of the original thing, had copied and uses covenant to entrap many people in different places. You hear uh, people talk about their family deities and all that and all that. And so it's important to understand why Jesus Christ fulfilled that, if you like, call it requirement of the law. So he fulfilled the law to establish the new covenant so that both the Jews and the Gentiles can all be brought into one, into one savior. And that is Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. I haven't explained that. We want to have a discussion today on notable lessons and characters that play a key part. I've already talked about Peter and Paul. And I made some points here that you will see that they are representative of this way that we have all been brought into. And it's very relevant to look at their lives today. So you can always group everyone who has come into the way into those who have come as Jews and those who have come as Gentiles. But there is no difference in Christ. Glory be to God. So in Christ, we are one. Jesus Christ has made provision, therefore, for both Jews and Gentiles to come into Christ. Those who had the law and the covenant of the blood of bulls and goats, and those who didn't have the law, and yet they are practicing their idols, sacrificing and doing all manner of things, all that have been replaced by one covenant of God in the blood of Jesus. And through Jesus alone, salvation is granted to all humankind, whosoever comes and believes. So with that in mind, we want to discuss then some key lessons that these believers, this way people, these Christians, like you and I today, have experienced. So number one, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, they preached Jesus and souls were saved. They worked miracles. They had power over satanic agents. They were able to impart the Holy Spirit to others. They faced persecution and imprisonment due to their faith. So 
They had trials of faith. That's what we call it. They face political and religious authorities as oppositions. They had angelic visitation and many other lessons and challenges. So on all these headings and headlines and any other one, I believe you have a discussion. You have something to present. So please go ahead and make your presentation now. Who wants to go first? Brother Darren, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The first thing that, uh, one of the first thing that jumped out for me whilst I study was the resolution of the Christians dotted across the different um, chapters is one thing that was certain was persecution. Christians were persecuted right from, okay, immediately after they received the Holy Spirit and they waited in verse, in verse two, different types of persecution. But somehow the faith of these people that uh, the people in Antioch called Christians continue to remain steadfast. Unlike now, if I put it side by side with even me as a, as a believer, you know, little things happen in life and I'm beginning to wonder is God with me and all of those things. They had such assurance, unshakable assurance. That's one for me. Then number two, I read, I wrote places where Saul, Acts 8, 1 to 3, Acts 9, 1 to uh, 19, Acts, things that uh, when Saul was persecuting Christians with so much, um, there's a word that I'm looking for, the, there was vengeance in his action. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the best word. Mm -hmm. Now, on the road to Damascus, he encountered Christ. That's Acts 9, verse 1 to 19. And then Jesus spoke to him. He changed, went through the person who God uh, uh, the, directed him to go to. And then that same vigor with which he was, the passion, yes, passion is the word I've been looking for, the passion with which he was persecuting them. Apparently was doing that in ignorance, thinking was serving God. That same passion, it didn't change. You know, then this other, if I put it in, uh, how does he apply to us as believers now? You know, people say they, they, they sometimes even we say we have changed from unrighteous works to righteous works. And then we don't see that flow. We don't see that engagement. We don't see that much drive the same way that we were doing things to, you know, uh, uh, ascribe glory to the devil. And we come to become ambassadors of Christ and we don't see that same um, and passion. So this was a strong lesson. For me. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Dara. Thank you. I think that's the point you raised there that is what just touching it on. is around the um, um, today, today versus the ruggedness of the believers then. I, I think it's the same point I made earlier. Um, those who are in this transformed life uh, are still rugged and are still facing it. That's why I made the point that there were times when people thought they would kill and Christians wipe away Christians. They were, and they were killing them. They were burning Bibles, all manner of things. But the more they do that, the more Christians continue to increase because it is not a physical thing that anybody can trap. It is by the spirit of God. So this is indeed the essence of this study, is to bring us back to the real thing, that we follow the examples of Christ and those who have gone 
through Christ. Of course, like you also said, in all that, they had victory, always to mention that. They had victory, they fulfilled their purpose. Um, so trials will come, and they may come, but we have victory. Thank you very much for that point. Okay, so the next person is doctor. <laughs> doctor, what would you have to share? Yes, um, what struck me in looking at some events in the Acts is that the healing power of uh, God still persisted, even after Christ ascended uh, through his, I mean, through the apostles. They were able to heal, and also, uh, I mean, demonstrate that God's power is there if we apply ourselves to his teachings. Uh, and uh, Christ demonstrated that the disciples also showed us. And it means that even after them, in this present day and age, such uh, should be possible if people really apply and wholeheartedly tune into the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed, indeed. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you for that excellent contribution. I think we'll just look at, that's one of the examples that we will just touch on To Like you've rightly said, it's all about how do we experience and, you know, live the way life that they lived and experienced as well. So thank you. I go to Joy. Joy. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, morning. So um, the book of Acts takes us through the story of Jesus's ascension back to heaven, the coming of the Holy Spirit and his disciples spreading the message of the gospel and bringing people around the world to salvation. It takes us through the spread of the gospel through Jerusalem and other parts of the world. So the major lessons I received from the book of Acts is to spread the message of salvation through my deeds and lifestyle, not just preaching. The way we act is usually what people see and take lessons from. And the disciples acted like Christ and they were therefore called Christians. So that was one lesson I took. Also from Acts chapter 9, we can take the lesson of redemption. It depicts through the story of Saul's conversion that it's not too late for us to forsake our evil ways and receive salvation. And there is no mistake too big to come back from if we seek genuine repentance. So those were the lessons I received from the book of Acts. Excellent. Let's look a bit at uh, the aspect of acted like Christ. So the disciples acted like Christ and they were called Christians. What did, does this entail? What acts, what, what, what were the acts of Christ? That they were acting like Christ. Please, can we discuss this? Yeah, what, what are your thoughts on this? The disciples acted like Christ and that's why they were called Christians. So what were these acts? Well, they performed miracles like Jesus did while he was around. They preached the word of salvation. They healed the sick, the sick people. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So that gives us uh, the package. They preached, they performed miracles, and they live a sinless life because Jesus was always challenging the people when he was around and said of which of you have convicted me of sin you can't find sin in me yeah thank you for that thank you preached performed miracles and lived sinless life a holy life so that is the life that people will see us see in us and then follow and uh, become, I want to also have this good life, have this salvation, yeah, being like Christ, uh, just like uh, Joy said. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Sister Comfort, are you ready to make your contribution? <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity. 
I am, you know, I'm always very, very impressed by the book of Acts. I think it, it is a, a roadmap for Christians. It has really helped me to overcome some of the things I used to worry about. <laughs> if, when I look at uh, this breaking of bread, okay, the, the, the Lord's Supper, or uh, the memorial, yeah. I, I, I have seen that it was activities that the disciple performed regularly. When you look at the uh, Acts chapter two, verse yes. 42, mm -hmm. they said they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, it means this thing, it was not something they kept for a, a period of time mm -hmm. until it comes. So it was, what they did regularly. Mm -hmm. And also at 20, chapter 20, if you look at this, uh, is it that from five? Is it, this man went on ahead and waited for us at trust, but we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others I trust. So on living bread and the breaking of bread, I'm sure is the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I can see it was a mean that the disciple used to express, okay, to affirm this um, communion or uh, the covenant blood that Christ Jesus made for them. Yeah. So it, so, it let me see that. Okay, you wanted to say something? No, no, I wanted to just say, the, add verse 7 to what you were reading. Because yeah. I think verse 7 was part of it. You see, they probably did it every week, actually. Okay. Read so, verse what, 7 of 20. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Yes, Paul spoke to people to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, yeah. kept on talking until midnight. So it, 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 I, like I said, the vision, the mission of Christian had been exposed, I don't know, in the books of Acts so much that I, I think it was written for the benefit of Christian. Yes. And also, when I look at the verse 10, what happened with uh, Cornelius? Chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 10. Yes. Cornelius and Peter. Cornelius was an Italian. It wasn't a Christian, but mm -hmm. he did what was right. Mm -hmm. So that is God. That is how generous our father is. If he can see anything good in you, he knows how to reach you. That is why I always say, Father, search for your sheep. Mm -hmm. Search for them. You know where they are mm -hmm. and find them. And yeah. this really confirms at the verse 34 of that thing. And Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, yeah. but except from every nation, yes. the one who fears him mm -hmm. and does what is right. Amen. So Christian, why do we now, if you don't come to my roof, my mm. wall, mm. My, my, my congregation, mm. as I am telling you, I have benefited greatly. I'm sure yes. every other person with open mind will see what Christ wants us to do, what God wants in us. He want that passion like Brother Dara said, passion in serving him, in doing what is right. Yeah. 
in obey yielding to his direction and command. So thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, excellent. So I'm going to share my screen again. Then we'll read a few of the things you've talked just to again touch on them. Um, using the life of Peter and Paul and others, as you would see. So back to that, uh, my slide. And this time we'll just read a few scriptures. All right. So here I tabulated. Um, and as we have seen that there is no difference between Gentile and uh, Jews. Christ is for all. And Paul emphasized this a lot in his letters. It's for all. So um, as we said here that to the implementation of this will, you know, includes this Holy Spirit, those who receive, who come into the way and then they preach and they demonstrate the power of God and the holiness, they live the fullness of God's this life. So that guides this list. So few with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter two, we know that Peter and the, all the other members of the 120 were with him, were few with the Holy Spirit. Paul, who was not um, the, among the 12, nor the 120, the one who persecuted the church, as uh, Joy described, when he came, he was also filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's look at, remind ourselves of that in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18, very quickly, 9, 17 and 18. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did we see that? Laying his hands on him, Ananias, he who believed. He was also not one of the 12 apostles. He was the one Jesus used to bring Paul, rather, saw in to the way. After Jesus, he had had an encounter with Jesus. To preach Jesus and souls were saved. When we preach with the power of the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts sinners. You see many people get into arguments, how they know the, this, that, 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 that. If you depend on the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's just one word, God loves you. There have been many testimonies of people who have said God loves you. In fact, there is always this uh, story of a little child. If you remember, if you have come across it, uh, there's a trap who went uh, on evangelism, it was raining and he went knocking on this door, knocked and rang the bell, and eventually an old woman showed up. And this woman was trying to hang herself, the story has it. But at that time, what message did this young uh, boy have for her? Jesus loves you. And the word just stopped there. Of course, in the first instance, for somebody to come at that moment and ring the bell so persistently, that's how she was saved from taking her life. They walked miracles. And this is the one I want us to read again. And power over satanic agents. The same what happened in Paul's, in Peter's life, also happened in Paul's life. Let's look at Acts chapter 3, 1 to 8. We know that very well. The, day, uh, the, the lame man at the beautiful gate that was healed. Uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, Acts 5, 12, there the Bible says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. If we move to verse 14, look at verse 14 and read it with me. Say, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. 15, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, 
that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. If you compare that with the life, the life of Paul, Acts chapter 19, 11 and 12, the Bible says that God performed unusual miracles through the hands of Paul. Acts 19, 11 and 12. Say, now God walked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Just as Jesus has said, in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall heal the sick. If they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. Glory be to God. It wasn't only them. Let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse 8, 8, 6, and 8. In the life of Stephen and Philip. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Stephen was not one of the 12 apostles. Acts 6, verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Did great wonders and signs among the people. Acts 8, 6 to 8 is the story of Philip. 8, 6 to 8. And the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. Lame were healed by Philip. Look at verse 8. I love verse 8 because this is what God wants to do. He said, and there was great joy in that city. Brothers and sisters, you have to give yourself to the word, just like doctors say, that now you can see that this is possible if one gives himself and develops himself. The provision is there. It's God that does it. It's not me, it's not you, but we have to make ourselves available and we have to believe because it brings great joy. Even physical doctors, when they're able to treat a patient, especially a very severe one, oh, what great joy comes to people. How much more when it is the one that doctors say, ah, this one, we cannot handle it. It has gone beyond remedy. Yet the power of God is able to do it. Oh, like that lame man at that gate uh, called beautiful. You know, he was of age and he has been there. So Jesus kept doing this. And the believers, the people of the way, they were doing the same thing. And people saw their lives and said, these ones are like Christ. They are Christians. The other thing I want to emphasize is power over satanic agents because people worry about all this, break their heads. We have been delivered from the power of Satan and have actually been given the authority, like you saw there, handkerchief from the body of a Paul drove out demons. Same shadow of Peter, same with Philip, same with Stephen, is the same with you and I in the mighty name of Jesus. So let's look at that Acts chapter 8 again, 9, 11, and then in 18, 24, in the case of Peter and uh, Paul. Acts 8, 9 to 11. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. This is, and it's still going on now. So we jump 
2 verses 18 and 20 or to 24. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money, 19, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Let me pause there so you can see it's not by money. It's not. 20, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. So those people who tell you to come and sow seed and they will decree anointing on you and miracles will happen. Run away from it because you don't know where they have gotten their own that they are selling. If it is the one from God, it is not purchased with money. So Peter said to Simon, your money perish with you. But again, let me emphasize, please give to the men of God. Give, give, give. God wants us to give to the men of God. So you don't misunderstand me. Don't buy. Don't let them cajole you to do anything. But you must learn to give, 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 give. Let them not demand before you give. You must learn to give. It is more blessed to give than to receive, Paul said. So give to the men of God. Don't wait for them to ask. There is blessing in giving. There is blessing, great blessing. You must learn to give. Give to men of God, give to the needy, give to the poor. Do help work. Let's continue. So Peter said to him, I repeat verse 20, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this, your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So if you're hearing me and you are one of those that have been selling the anointing, selling the gift of God, you are like Simon the sorcerer, repent now. Repent now, repent now, that the Almighty God may forgive you and use you like he used Paul. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. 24, then Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God is the empowerment. And Jesus Christ himself is the one who directs the affairs, who manifests, he's still manifesting, he's in the name of Jesus. In that Acts chapter 3, Peter said, silver and gold I have not. But such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk is the same till today. It is the name of Jesus we preach. It is in the name of Jesus that the power of God is made manifest. So let's look at uh, Paul's um, experience as well. Acts chapter 13. Verse 8 to 12, Acts chapter 13, 8 to 12. And I think we'll just wrap it up. Acts 13, 8 to 12. So that was Simon the sorcerer bowed to Peter. And here, Elimas the sorcerer. Oh, his own was terrible. I read Acts chapter 13, verse 8. But Elima the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, which stood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Nine, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you see that? Is always with the Holy Spirit. That is the empowerment that Jesus Christ has sent from the Father to us, the believers. Now is our duty and place to walk in faith and by faith to release this joy to the world. I continue to read. 
Let me repeat that verse 9 and continue. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, All full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. The hand of the Lord is upon you. You know, that's been one of the prayer we have been praying. The hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. The Lord, brothers and sisters, I will give, let us take this as an assignment and go and study this again. Because there are many situations that we ought to speak and we don't speak. You could see here, Paul didn't pray. He didn't go to hide in the corner. Paul raised his voice there and spoke knowing the power of God that is upon him. Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the law. That same Acts chapter 8, you saw the impart, impart, imparting the Holy Spirit to others, which is also what happened um, in Acts chapter 19, verses 5 through 7. So uh, we've, we've seen the example of Ananias who prayed for uh, Paul or Saul at that time to receive the Holy Spirit. We can go on and on. When you study the Acts, you see how Peter and Paul and the rest of the disciples face the opposition of their days. The political and religious authorities both also had angelic visitations. Angelic visitations, the same as Philip. So there is so much brothers and sisters available to us who have come into the way that is now called Christians. Are you ready to walk in the fullness of God's blessing, God's spirit, God's power? So challenge us and make the point that I started with again, that the way the Christian life is by the Holy Spirit and it cannot be caged. It cannot be entrapped by any wall or any religious limitation. It is a movement to bring the will of God throughout the world. And so release yourself to the spirit of God and let the spirit use you to do the work like the disciples did in the book of Acts that is recorded. This is where we will stop today and we will take one more session, which is next Sunday. And when we come that next Sunday, we're going to uh, be praying and we won't stay long because that next Sunday, we should, you go out and witness, find something that you're going to do to continue to spread the will of God. That will be our focus. We'll gather and we will pray that this same power will manifest in every one of us. Don't wait till then. Now, take time and study. I, I think I'm going to share these materials now to us. And you take the scriptures, read them, and pray to God. Between now and, if I let's not wait till next Sunday. So between now and next Sunday, you have to live like a Christian. Amen. I think we have, in this study, talk about it. Um, when Joel said it, that the people saw that the disciples lived like Christ. And we asked the question, what does that entail? What did they do? And she said it so completely. They preached, they performed miracles, 
They live sinless life, just like Jesus Christ. That's the life we must live daily. There is no separation of you into um, uh, church time, home time, uh, business time, and all that. You are one person filled with the Holy Spirit. And in all this sphere, your life must demonstrate Christ. So you are the same person. Why you have these different times, rather? So in case somebody misunderstood what I meant. And different activities, you are the same person. And your life must remain the same at different, I, I mean, in all these involvement and all these engagements. Let us pray. A brother said today, a little trial, people will say, ah, where is God? Because many people have left focusing on the will of God that Jesus Christ has come to do. We are now competing in the space of the world with the world. Whereas the world need us to bring the change by bringing the will of Christ to them. Let's go to God in prayer and ask that this word that we have heard, this understanding God has given us, the spirit of God will quicken us to do the will of God. Go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for myself. I ask that you will quicken me by your spirit to do your word, to do your will, just as you have taught us. Pray for my brothers and sisters that every one of us, Lord, we will be quickened by your spirit to do your will. Thank you, our Lord and our God. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. And so go by faith. Doubt nothing. God is with you. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Preach Jesus Christ. Preach salvation in the name of Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit of God that gives us the power, that guides us, that helps us, that convicts sinners and brings souls to God. And may he manifest all this in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Bye.